My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Paul Dubov as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story titled A Cure for Insomnia. An ad in the papers, that's what started this one off. There were three dead and one to go by the time we got to the last half of the last inning of it, and it looked like the pitcher that was tossing the strikeouts was shooting for my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. It got rolling the kind of day you don't see much around L.A. Storm breaking about ten in the morning when I got down to the Lyon Detective Bureau office. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my boy, be careful where you stand. What's the matter, Lion? Drop an olive? Oh, don't be funny. Your feet are muddy and we can't afford to have the carpet cleaned. Not the way business is going these days. Yeah, well, okay, Lion. Uh, mind if I sit down? My overcoat's wet. Well, then take it off first. Regan, our books don't balance for the month of April. Wait a minute. Leave your coat on and don't sit down. So we got a new client. Yes, Jeffrey. I was sitting here at my desk 20 minutes ago trying to balance our books. And the phone and... rang and it was a new client. Uh, exactly, Jeffrey. Who? A man named Paulson. He lives in Hollywood in the hills above Hollywood and Vine on Chapman Boulevard. Seven seven oh seven and a half. And you better get out there right away. Somebody's life in danger, maybe? Hmm? Life in danger? Oh, no, no. The victim's already dead. Mrs. Paulson. Paulson's wife. He murdered Paulson, says he. he wants us to prove it. Paulson wants us to prove his wife was murdered? Yes. You see, Mrs. Paulson died seven or eight days ago. The police say she committed suicide. But Mr. Paulson would be so much happier if it would turn out that she were murdered, Jeffrey. Nice fellow. Isn't he, my boy? He wants to pay us $100. Not what I meant. Hmm? Well, Look, Lion, if Mrs. Paulson died seven or eight days ago, what's so urgent about my getting out there this morning? The $100, Jeffrey. Oh, I get it. As I explained to you, my boy, try as I might, scheme as I would, our April books refuse to balance. Now, uh, I've been thinking that perhaps one little fee carried backwards uh, from the first week of May might... Okay, ba- Fatso, set your calendar back to standard time. I'll go out and talk to Paulson. <laughs> I went. Through bus or rain, eating off hillside frontage, sluicing California down glutted drains that couldn't keep up. I turned right at Sunset and Niagara, went up two blocks, forded Hollywood Boulevard. Chapman Boulevard was half a dozen blocks of twisted hill lit, bleary, tile roofed stucco houses. 7707 and a half, where Paulson lived, was the rear third of a triplex. I parked my car, turned up my overcoat collar, went back. Mr. Regan. That's right. Oh, come in. I'm Paulson. Come in. Oh. Uh, now, just sit down, Mr. Regan. I'll tell you everything. All about it. All that happened. Sure, sure. Just let me get out of my overcoat. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks. I got uh, it. Ah. Uh, you uh, seem pretty upset, Paulson. Yes, yes. The thing is, I can't endure doubting any longer. I, I can't stand the doubt, the fear that my wife wasn't murdered. Uh, Paulson... Doesn't it strike you as a little queer that a guy'd want to spend a hundred bucks with private dicks to prove his wife was murdered? Oh, no, 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 not at all. You'd better give me the rundown, Paulson. Yes, yes, that would be best. Well, my wife's name was Linda, Linda Paulson. We'd been married seven years, and we were very much in love with each other. Seven nights ago, quietly in her twin bed, the other bed where she slept, in our bedroom, that room there, uh, Mr. Regan... Go on. Uh, Linda died in the night. Sometime in the night. You woke up in the morning and found her dead? Yes. And, Mr. Regan, it it was ascertained that Linda had died of poison. What the cops have to say about it? Well, of course, they investigated, but their verdict was suicide. Capsules containing the same poison that killed Linda were found in her purse. And there were other things. I don't know quite what. But the police were convinced that Linda had definitely taken the poison herself. Well, then, that about settles it, doesn't it, Paulson? Except except for Linda's motive. Motive? Uh, That's the term used in these matters, isn't it? Well, Linda had no reason to want to die. No motive for killing herself. 
You seem sure of that. I... I was. I was sure of it, but... But now I've begun to doubt. And that's why I want help. Don't you see? If Linda wasn't murdered, if it was suicide as the police seem so sure, then that means that my wife wanted to die. That means that our... Our life together, when I thought we were very happy, wasn't what it seemed to be at all. I see what you mean. And that's why you want me to prove it was murder. Yes, Mr. Regan. It makes sense. All right, Paulson, heat up some coffee, huh? We'll get to work. Paulson brewed coffee. Like I'd hoped, it steadied him down. He gave me what he could. It wasn't much. He and his wife were ordinary middle bracket people. No love triangles, Paulson said. Mrs. Paulson hadn't had any money of her own. Her life hadn't been insured. Paulson said she'd been perfectly normal. No depression, nothing queer, right up to her death. I took down the names and addresses of some of the friends and relatives, told Paulson I want to check around. Then I went downtown to Homicide, dropped in on Lieutenant Sanducci. All right, Regan, what can I do for you? It's about a woman named Linda Paulson, Sanducci. Oh, sure, sure. the woman that killed herself a week or so ago. Look, Sanducci, the husband's retained me to prove she didn't kill herself. He thinks she was murdered. Thanks, Regan. Listen, have you seen the house where it happened? Came from there just now. Well, then, narrow bottleneck passage back to it between two front houses. Yeah. The night it happened, it was hot. The neighbors had their chairs out at the head of the passage... Nobody could get in or out without being seen. Maybe Paulson killed her himself. Thought of that? We're not amateurs here at the department, Regan. Paulson was out at a meeting. Mrs. Paulson went to bed at 10.30. Neighbor saw the lights go out in the house. Neighbor see Paulson come home? At 25 after 11. Went to bed in the dark. His wife was a poor sleeper. He didn't want to disturb her. We haven't told him this, Regan, but she was dead then. You got the time of the death from the reaction of the poison. Plus the state of the cadaver. I figured the two together, she took the poison when she went to bed at 10.30, died 10 minutes later. And there's a clincher, Regan. Go on. The pill box Mrs. Paulson kept in her purse, uh, kind of unusual. It had a key that she kept on a chain around her neck. That's where it was when you saw the body? Yes. And the pill box in the purse was locked? That's right, Regan. No tampering with the lock. Mrs. Paulson's fingerprints in the box and nobody else's. And we know she was alone in the house when she took the poison. Now, look, Regan, you talked to her husband. He told you she had no motive to kill herself, same as she told us. That's right. Well, did he give you the whole rundown, Regan, about how they had no enemies, the woman had no money, no insurance? Nice, decent, ordinary people, Regan. Not the kind to be mixed up in crime or rackets. He gave me that. Maybe it suggested something to you? Sure, Sanducci. Sure it did. If Paulson's story checks, there won't be any motive for Mrs. Paulson's having killed herself. And there won't be motive for anybody else having killed her either. That's right, Regan. Oh, and Regan, Paulson's story checks. It checked. I cruised through the rain, visited people who knew the Paulsons. Everybody said the same thing. No reason, no motive, for murder or suicide. Only there had to be a reason. I'd start with that. At the newspaper morgue downtown, I got the beginning of something. Hey, sure, Regan, I remember the Paulson thing. <laughs> you know my reputation, Regan. Morgan, the, the guy, guy who, who never, never forgets, forgets a thing. thing. Sure, sure, I know, Morgan. Why, I've come to you. Yeah, well, I could give it to you verbatim. Don't have to look it up in the files. You know, it's like they say, Morgan, Morgan never forgets. <laughs> well, let's see, Linda Paulson, you said, huh? Suicide. Well, her maiden name was Linda Kales. Say, wait a minute. Got something? Maybe. Just let me check a minute. Huh? The Oregon papers. We keep them, too. We keep papers from every place. Yep. Portland, Oregonian. Yeah, it was Portland, all right. The Oregonian. March, uh, yeah, March 18th. And the sixth page, and I think it was the fifth column. Uh, no, 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 no. Here it is. Sixth page, fourth column. Well, it slipped up, Regan. Anyway, here it is. Scales. Let's see that. Yeah, sure, look. Yeah. Scales. Yeah, brother, Regan. Yeah. He died suddenly in bed March 17th, survived mm. by three sisters, all residing in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, and here it is, Regan, the thing I remembered. One of those sisters... Yeah, yeah. Linda Kales Paulson. 
I phoned the lion. Told him to get through to Sanducci in homicide, try to get Sanducci to have the Portland police exhume the body of the dead brother, perform an autopsy for possible evidence of poison. Me? I got on the track of the surviving sisters around L.A. One was married. Her home phone didn't answer. But five or six phone calls got me a line on the other sister. She was unmarried. Her name was Jane Kales. She worked at a resort up in San Gabriel Canyon, about a two-hour drive from L.A. I went up there. Oh, boy. <laughs> Looks like you don't like our snow up here, mister. Uh, you're right, I don't. Sometimes we get it this late in the year. We're 5,000 feet up. We'll sit down to the counter and have something hot. Okay, coffee. I'm the cashier, but while the counter girl's on a red You're the house, cashier, huh? Yeah, that's right. I'm looking for you. You're Jane Kales. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, so what? Here's your coffee. My name's Regan. I'm a private detective, thanks. Well, well, well what do you want with me? I, I ain't done nothing. I, I mind my own business. Hey, take it easy. Well, I, I'm edgy. I, I don't get my sleep. Haven't ever slept good. It, it runs in the family. But now that my sister Linda's gone and poisoned herself... Why, I'm here. Her husband doesn't think she did poison herself. What do you think? I'll tell you what I think. I think it's a sin. I've been lying awake nights. Lying awake asking myself, how could Linda have done a thing like that? Maybe your sister was murdered. <gasps> have you thought of that? What? Linda? Maybe your brother up in Oregon, too. Oh, that's impossible. There wouldn't be any reason. There wouldn't be any reason. Money someplace in the family, maybe, Jane? Oh, no. No, we don't have any money. Not for 20 years. 20 years? Well, Dad had money before the crash, but he lost it. Got cleaned out in 29. He died four years later. Okay, okay, Jane. And there's just you and your married sister down in L.A. left in the family now. Y yes, Caroline. That's my other sister. Caroline Kales Martz. She married Charlie Martz 11 years ago. Yeah, Mr. Regan. Caroline and I are, are the only ones left. Back down in L.A. about 6.30, I was lucky. I got Caroline on the phone. She and her husband were going out to dinner, but she said they'd be back by 10. About a quarter past 10, I went over. By half past, we had the brush cleared away and we're down to Tell business. Tell you the truth, Mr. Regan. My husband and I have discussed it and discussed it. We just can't believe that Linda oh, would have... Oh, uh, pardon me, Mr. Regan? Sure, Martz. We just can't believe that Linda would have killed herself. Mrs. Martz. Yes? Suicide's usually prompted by love trouble or ill health. Well, there, there certainly wasn't any love trouble. Well, Linda and her husband were very happy. And health? Well... Of course, Linda would sometimes say that... Yes, Mrs. Mart? Well, only that if she couldn't rest, if she couldn't get more sleep, you know, she'd... Well, she'd kill herself. But all of us in our family sleep very poorly, and I'm sure that every one of us must have said oh, that Mr. at one... Mr. Regan, can you come here a minute? The, the phone is for you. Excuse me. Yes, of course. The phone's hung up, Mart. Oh, yes. Yes, I... I didn't want Caroline to hear. What's up? Mr. Regan, this thing is beginning to take on a pattern. A pattern that frightens me for my wife. That was San Gabriel Canyon on the phone. Yes, it was. The, the night cashier at the resort took sick this evening. They went to get my wife's sister, Jane, to fill in. It had snowed and then stopped. There were no tracks to Jane's cabin but her own. She was alone... Wait a minute. You're going to tell me they found her dead. Suicide, Mr. Regan. She'd taken poison. <laughs> The way this case went, it looked like the Kales clan had developed quite a taste for poison. Linda Kales Paulson died of it. Then there was a brother dead up in Oregon. My money had it, they'd find he died of poison too if they dug him up and took a look. And then there was a third Kales, Jane, dead too. San Gabriel Canyon, poison. I told Charlie Martz to keep a close eye on the last Kales left alive, his wife. Then I headed for San Gabriel Canyon. Snowplow was working on the road the last mile up. Had to wait a while, so I phoned the lion in L.A. At home, it was midnight. Anthony K. Lyons, 
butler speaking. May I take a message for Mr. Lyon? He's out. You don't tell me, Fatso. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, why are you calling at this hour? Why are you out? Hiding from somebody? Why, but, 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 no, of course not. Okay, skip it. Here's what I want you to do. Check the airline, train, and bus offices. They're open all night. Find out if any of the Kales family or in-laws had a reservation up to Portland, Oregon, any time just before the brother died up there. You're very well, Jeffrey. Phone me if you get anything. I'll be at Clemens Mountain Resort, San Gabriel Canyon. Maybe an hour or two. Get going and good luck. The snowplow finished clearing the road, and I went on up San Gabriel Canyon. There was one light left on in the resort cafe. Sitting under it, Lieutenant Sanducci. Well, Regan, I thought you'd be showing up here. Who sent you up, Sanducci? You did, Regan. You and the lion. I checked with the Portland police. They were fast up there. So the brother was poisoned. He was poisoned, Regan. And this girl up here. And the first sister, Linda Paulson. And now the third sister. Third? Give me that again. Caroline March, down in Los Angeles. I'm waiting for the phone now for a report under condition. I told her husband to keep an eye on her. He said he did, Regan. She was nearly hysterical over her sister's death up here. She went into the bathroom, crying half sick. Well, in a few minutes, Marts heard her cry out. He ran in, and she was unconscious on the floor. Called an ambulance, and they rushed to the receiving hospital. And she'd been poisoned. Like the others, Regan. Now, Regan, this one up here, this Jane Cales, every bit of evidence points to suicide. That th- there was fresh snow. Only her tracks led to the cabin. Two or three extra poison capsules and a medicine chest. Jane Kales didn't commit suicide. You know that, Regan? I talked to her this afternoon. She hated suicide. Couldn't understand how anybody could do such a thing. But if it's murder, Regan, why? What motive? Yeah, sure. And how? How does the killer pull it off? Oh, that'll be the hospital report on Mrs. Caroline Mart's condition. Excuse me a second. Sure. Hello, Sanducci. Huh? Oh, 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 just a minute. No, it's for you, Regan. Must be the lion. Maybe he's got something for us. I had him working on a lead. Hello, lion. This is Regan. No, no, this is Morgan. You know, Morgan, who never forgets a thing at the newspaper morgue. Oh, hi, Morgan. Yeah, I phoned Anthony Lyon. He told me how to reach you. Yeah, what's on your mind? Uh, <laughs> I forgot something, Regan. <laughs> you did, Morgan? Yeah, something in the San Fernando Valley Times on March 7th on Kale. Go on, Morgan. You see, we don't file the Valley Times, but I remember it verbatim. You see, it's like they say... Yeah, Morgan never forgets a thing. What was it in the Valley Times about Kale? Uh, well, it was an ad, Regan. In the lower left-hand corner in the seventh page, two columns wide, I'd say about three-column inches, a three-line bold face head with a wide margin, and the last line of type didn't print quite clear. Okay, Morgan, what did it say? Well, Bank of United States, North Hollywood, California, and then there was some stuff about the bank. What did it say? Oh, you know, capitalization, when it was founded. You want that? You can skip that part. What did it say about Kales? Uh, Bertram Kales? Yeah. Oh, well, Bertram Kales has $73,000 in the Bank of United States in North Hollywood. But there's been no activity in the account for 20 years. So yeah? if Kales or some relation don't show up to claim the dough, why the bank is going to turn it over to the treasurer of the state of California. The regular legal process, you know, the ad is the formal notification. Thanks a lot, Morgan. You've just given me the motive for three murders. <laughs> begins to make sense now, Regan. Dollar sense. Bertram Kales would be the father of the tribe. He was in the Bucks once, got cleaned out in a crash. Jane Kales told me that this afternoon. Only he must have stashed away one bank account, 73,000 smacks he didn't tell anybody about. Mm, he wouldn't have wanted the investigators to find it if he failed in business about that time. Probably planned to use the dough a few years later after the squeeze was off. Only he died four years after the crash. Jane Kales told me that too. It adds up, Regan. It adds up. A mass murder. All the Kale's children had equal claims to their dead father's dough. So somebody started knocking off the children systematically, one by one. Object? To get all the 73,000. That's the why of it, all right. And what we got left is the how. And the who. Maybe that'll be the lion now. If the lead he's working on pans out, we may have our who. Hello, lion. San Gabriel Canyon? Yes, that's right. I'd like to speak to Lieutenant Sanducci of the Los Angeles Police Department, please. This is Georgia Street Receiving Hospital calling. I signaled Sanducci and he took the booth. 
I went back to the counter, watched Sanducci through the glass. What he got over the phone he didn't like. He came busting out of the booth. Reagan, wait till you hear this. What's up, Sanducci? What's up? I tell you what's up. Caroline Mott's recovered. They pumped out her stomach. Her stomach contained the same poison that killed her two sisters and her brother. That figures. Sure it figures. But Caroline kills Mott. Got to the hospital in time. She didn't die like the others. You mean you think she took poison as a cover-up? She was the last surviving Keel's child. The way it is now, she gets a $73,000. But she's got a nice outfit, and if we suggest she poisoned her brother and sisters... Yeah, yeah, she got poisoned too. Yeah, it could be that. Well, we better get down to town and ask Caroline some questions. Well, that, that's what I've been trying to tell you. When she turned out to be all right, Regan, those nitwits I left in charge down there released her. She disappeared. <laughs> Sanducci and I drove back to L.A. He used the siren on his police car, and I stuck right behind in his windstream. We got back down to town after 4 a.m. Nobody home at the Mart's house. We found only one thing. On Caroline Kale's Mart's dressing table, a black mask. A silk-covered, padded black mask, no eye holes. The kind people use to keep out the light when they're trying to sleep. <laughs> About six in the morning, I left Sanducci, pulled into a drive-in for coffee and. Rain had stopped. I kept thinking of that black mask on Caroline Kale's March dressing table, sleeping mask, and something that had run through the whole case like a thread of music. Caroline had said it. Jane Kales had said it. It had been said of Linda, the first sister to die. We don't sleep well. It runs in the family. We don't sleep well. At seven, I phoned the lion. No answer. So I began checking the airline, railway, and bus offices myself. The fourth time around, I got the brass ring. Paulson had bought Transportation Oregon a week before the brother's death in Portland. I wanted to talk to him bad. But, uh, but Mr. Regan, I, I'm afraid I'm hardly awake. Just I... sit and listen, Paulson. What I've got to say will wake you up. I think I can guess how the members of your wife's family were poisoned. You can, Mr. Regan? There's plenty of evidence they took the poison themselves. Yes, yes. And they weren't trying to commit suicide when they did it. I hope that's true in the case of my wife. It is. Because there's a way it makes sense. Murder sense. The victims took poison thinking they were taking something else. Your wife made quite a career of pill-taking, didn't she, Paulson? Well, well, yes. Just her nerves, of course. Maybe overstrained by lack of sleep? The Kales family insomnia? Yes, yes, that was it, Mr. Regan. She had a pillbox with a lock, kept the key to it on a chain around her neck. Somebody close to her might have been able to get hold of that key, unlock the pillbox, substitute poison pills for the pills already in the box. I see, I see. That must be how it happened, and... And with Jane and with Caroline. And your brother-in-law up in Portland, Oregon. He was poisoned, too? That's right. Paulson, you made a trip up to Oregon just before he died. Uh, that's right, with my wife. A sort of second honeymoon, Mr. Regan. Paulson, maybe you can guess what I'm thinking. I mean, Mr. Regan, you, you don't mean you think that I... That you I... You were here at the time of the poisonings. Yes, I, that's true. And you were there in Portland. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't go to Portland. What? I, I didn't go. Well, I meant to go. You went to Oregon? Yes, Linda and I. Crater Lake, the Oregon Caves, and then we were going to Portland. The whole family was to meet there for my brother-in-law's 50th birthday. Well, at the Oregon Caves, I had bad news for my business, and I had to come back here. Then who was at Portland, Paulson? Well, the, the rest of the family. Including Caroline and Charlie Martz? Yes, yes, of course. Answer it, Paulson. Uh, yes, all right. Caroline. I had to come. Something awful happened. Hello, Mrs. Martz. Mr. Regan, I had no idea you'd be here, but I guess it's just as well. Mr. Regan, do you know the terrible thing that's happened? That your husband gave you poison? Then you do know. In your sleeping pills, I guess. Yes. He... Charlie began saying he couldn't sleep. Faked insomnia, then asked to borrow your sleeping pills. Yes. Filled the capsules with poison, then returned them. He knew you'd take them. We all... All of us, the whole family suffers from insomnia. All the Kale's family. We depend on sleeping pills. As your husband knew. Yes. But why? Why did my husband want to kill me? He didn't, Caroline. He knew he'd get you to the hospital in time. He just wanted to make things look right. So there wouldn't be a lot of questions asked when you got $73,000. Hey, 
half of which would be your husband's under California community property law. Well, that wrapped it up, all except one thing. We didn't have the killer. I phoned Sanducci, and he got the boys on it. An hour went by, two hours, three hours. No trace of medium-sized, graying, dapper Charlie Martz. That wasn't all. I kept phoning the office, the lion's house. There was no trace of the lion. About noon, I began rechecking the air, bus, and rail terminals. Uh, thank you for waiting, sir. May I help you now? I'm checking on train reservations to the north, Oregon, for the first couple of weeks of March. I'm a private detective. Next, you'll be saying you want to know about the reservation to Portland, Oregon, obtained in March by Charles March. Are you psychic? Hardly. But there was another private detective here this morning asking the same question. A fat man smelled of stale cigars. That's what I want. That's who I'm looking for. Uh, that hardly makes you special. I noticed that someone was following the fat man. Gimme? Well, uh, a medium-sized, graying, dapper man. Mars. Marts! Sanducci, I won't stick here in your office any longer. I'm going out on it. Reagan, Reagan. I got 20 boys looking for Marts. The whole force is alerted. Man at the airport, a man at Union Station, man at the bus terminal. What could you do alone? I don't know, Sanducci, but he's tailing the lion. Uh, Sanducci. Huh? Oh, okay, I'll be right down. Well, Regan, we picked up Marts. They're holding him downstairs. Well, Sanducci? Well? Marts won't talk. Sanducci, you gotta make him talk. Look, I've been in a cell with him, Regan. He says he never saw anybody that answers the lion's description. He's lying, Sanducci. Well, he may be, but what can I do? Well, here you are, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, why aren't you at the office? Are you taking the day off? Lion, it's you. Well, of course it's me. Jeffrey, I've been worried about you. You've been worried about me? Well, you haven't been home all day, and when I've telephoned the office, no answer. Jeffrey, do we run a business or do we not? Well, you weren't at the office, Fatso. Oh, no, I wasn't. Lion, what is this? What do you mean, what is it? I should be asking you all day away from the office in my hour of need. I told you our April books don't balance. You told me, sure. Well, Jeffrey, one of our creditors got on my trail this morning. Oh, no. Not a medium-sized, graying, dapper man? Yes, a medium-sized, graying, dapper man. Uh, Mr. Lucius Cronkite of Cronkite and Bowles, Pencil Sharpeners and Accessories. He's outside the <laughs> office right now, Jeffrey, and he wants $13. <laughs> Did you collect our fee from Mr. Paulson, Jeffrey? <laughs> sure, Lion. Sure, I collected it. Here you are. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Paul Dubov as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking and inviting you to be with us again for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator.